Hey everybody, Dr. Duncan here with Conservation Biology. And uh, for uh, the next few minutes, I want to talk to you about Alabama biodiversity. In this chapter, we're covering the textbook for Conservation Biology. The topic is, where is biodiversity found? Well, as it turns out, we're sitting on a lot of it here in Alabama. So let's figure out what's here and why we have it. That's what we're going to cover in these next few minutes. All right, so uh, the, it's a great big world, lots of cool ecosystems from the high Arctic to the tropical rainforest, from high altitudes to lowlands to caves to five kilometers below our feet. Biodiversity is in all these areas of the biosphere. And um, we are still, as scientists, discovering where species are found and what species are out there. And um, Alabama is no different. Um, there are a lot of species discovered in Alabama in recent years, uh, unlike other states that have been better studied. Um, not as many as, of course, are being found in the, the world's tropics and coral reefs and so forth. But Alabama is still a region of discovery when it comes to biodiversity. Now let's take a look at uh, what is known about Alabama. In fact, let me find out what you know about Alabama with a pop quiz. Uh, here's your question. Uh, which of the 50 states ranks number one for species biodiversity in the East? Anybody? Anybody? You're right. It's Alabama. That's right. Alabama has more species than any state east of the Mississippi River. And when we look at Alabama compared to all 50 states, uh, we rank number five for total biodiversity. A couple caveats here. This is based on a report that came out uh, almost 20 years ago now in April 2002. And it was only for certain groups of organisms because we don't have complete lists of many different taxa. Um, and But we do have enough um, lists from each state for these taxa down here that the um, that Bruce Stein, who, com who, did, who compiled these statistics almost 20 years ago now, uh, was able to um, to to do these rankings uh, for uh, a group called NatureServe, which organizes um, uh, species data for the for the world, um, especially here in the U.S., and works with groups like the Nature Conservancy to keep track of where species are and and so forth. And that ranking pegged us at number five in the U.S. among states. And you'll notice that we're just a few species behind New Mexico and. Um, and a couple hundred species uh, south of uh, Arizona. Both of those states have had a lot more study than has Alabama, and Alabama has a lot more diversity of ecosystems where it's easy for species to hide because we're so lush and jungle-like compared to, say, Arizona or New Mexico. So uh, many of us that know a thing or two about biogeography, the study of the distribution of species across geographic regions, um, a lot of us uh, that are interested in biogeography think that Alabama will ultimately rank number three amongst U.S. states once we've got all the data that we, um, that we have on what's in the state. Or maybe when we include more taxa down here, Alabama will rank up more highly. Okay? But for now, um, we're, we're, five's a pretty, pretty good spot, so we'll, we'll be happy with five for now. All right, so what group of organisms do we really have uh, the corner on, um, the corner market on, so to speak? Uh, we can start with freshwater fishes. Uh, Alabama is number one state for freshwater fish biodiversity. Uh, we have, um, we are also a hotspot on the North American continent, the hotspot for uh, biodiversity. That means a hotspot is an area with a high, high concentration of something, in this case, a species for fish. Um, the state has over 300 species of fish, um, and that includes almost 40% of all North American species are found in the state. A lot of these fish, about 140 of them, are either endemic or near endemic. So that's almost half of the species in the state are just found in Alabama or are shared with one other state, and usually by just a little bit. Like the core population will be in Alabama, and Georgia gets a little piece of the population or Tennessee or maybe Mississippi or Florida. Okay, so in terms of freshwater fishes, Alabama rocks. 
All right, to put that in perspective, this is a map of the lower 48, and we're going to look at two watersheds, the Columbia and the Colorado. Both are very large, very important watersheds. Get a lot of money for funding uh, to, to work on fish populations and river restoration in those watersheds. However, um, the Columbia only has 33 native fish species, and the Colorado uh, watershed only has 25 native fish species. Let's look at just one watershed in Alabama, the Cahaba watershed, right there at the heart of the state. The Cahaba alone has 128 native fish species, which is four to five times more than the Columbia or Colorado River. And that helps put in perspective how and that Alabama is such a biodiversity hotspot when it comes to freshwater fishes. All right, moving on. Uh, we are also pretty famous for our snails. Um, we have more snails concentrated in Alabama than anywhere else on the planet. Did you get that? We're a planetary hotspot for freshwater snails. Pretty cool. You can brag about that to your friends that live out of state. Um, amongst U.S. states, uh, therefore, we are number one. No surprise there, given that we're a global hotspot. There's about 150 species of snail in the in Alabama, and um, the state has a has the um, has a lot of the species of gill breathing snails, um, which is a subcategory of snails. A lot of the snail biodiversity is in the Mobile River Basin. That's all the landscape that drains down to uh, the Mobile Bay, and um, in within the Mobile River Basin. Um, almost all of the species of snail that are there are endemic to that basin, meaning they are not found in any other uh, watershed basins. Um, so that means that because the basin is primarily in Alabama, that means that all those species are pretty much Alabama species. Okay, moving on here. Another mollusks group that we have in Alabama and that we're famous for are our mussels. We are also a global hotspot for mussels. Um, we have 22% of the world's species are found in the state. And, and of course, this makes us uh, number one U.S. state for mussel biodiversity. There's about 100, um, almost just over 182 species are known for Alabama. Um, there's rough, I think it's like two roughly 280 species that are known for the Southeast, just FYI. Um, of the species in Alabama, about a third of them are either endemics, meaning they're only found in Alabama, or they're near endemics. And of the North American species, 60% are found in Alabama. You don't have to know all these stats. You just have to know that like Alabama um, is a global hotspot for muscle biodiversity and is the number one uh, state for um, for biodiversity in that a lot of our species are endemic. Ditto with the other taxa. Big picture. Okay, crayfish. Uh, perhaps you only know crayfish from crawfish boils, um, but it turns out that there's a lot of species of crawfish in the southeast, and Alabama is the global hotspot for crawfish uh, or crayfish or mud bug or crawdad uh, biodiversity. Um, we are the number one state for crawfish with almost 100 species, especially if you include the, uh, a few of the um, exotic invasive species that um, have been, been introduced into the state. So we have uh, almost 100 species. Relatively poorly studied group of organisms. Uh, by contrast, mussels and snails have been studied a lot more, and certainly fishes a lot more than all of those. Um, but even mussels and snails have not been very well studied. There's just very few people that do taxonomy um, on, on these groups of organisms. All right, let's look at some other groups. Herpetological diversity. We are number one um, state for freshwater turtles. And in fact, the Mobile Tensaw River Delta has the highest turtle diversity on planet Earth. Pretty amazing. There's one spot that's in um, Central Asia that's just south of the... Um, the Himalayas um, in, in the tropics that has comparable um, turtle biodiversity. And that's just that one spot. So we've got, so we are at the, at, the, uh, at the top in terms of turtle diversity. For frogs, we're the number one in U.S. state for frogs uh, with 32 species. We're near the top for salamanders. I have not seen a list across um, states for salamanders, but I know um, from other, other sources of data that we are near the top for salamander diversity. 
Okay, um, this in, is instead of a, a group of taxa, this is an ecological grouping of organisms, cave biodiversity, species that live below ground. And if you exclude the tropics and just look only in the temperate zone, um, Alabama um, is, has a, shares a, a corner of the region that's up with Georgia and Tennessee, and that, that region, that tri-state area, um, is the third most biodiverse um, region of the temperate world for cave fauna, cave uh, animals. Um, and with only about 10% of those caves up there explored, we might be at the very top when all is said and done, uh, at least in the temperate zones. Tropical cave systems um, you know, certainly beat us out in terms of having, having more species. Okay. Um, so... We've got all this biodiversity. That leads to the question, why do we have so many species in Alabama? And there's several answers. Um, we'll start with one answer being that we have so many different ecosystems. So we've got lots of different wetlands, uh, different types of wetlands throughout the state. Um, everything from streams to uh, a few natural lake systems in the state. Most of the state's lakes are created by dams and are um, basically not very helpful for biodiversity. They do a lot of harm to biodiversity in contrast. But we do have a few natural lakes in the state. Um, but we got lots of swamps and marshes of different types, and they all support different types of species. So this is one grouping of, of ecosystems, and we have a lot of them in the terms of wetlands. We also have lots of upland ecosystems, different types. Uh, this is the longleaf pine ecosystem, for example. It is naturally thin like that because fires roll through and keep other trees from moving in and getting too dense in here. And as a consequence, you wind up having this prairie-like environment down below um, that is loaded with plant species and uh, also herp species like reptiles and amphibians. Um, we've also got, in, um, in addition to the forests of the state, we've got lots of prairie types in the state. Now, these have been hit hard by agriculture. There's very few remnant prairies left in the state, but um, probably about a half a dozen to, to maybe a dozen different prairie types in the state originally. And prairies support different types of plants and some animals that are not found in other ecosystems. So again, illustrating that Alabama has a huge degree of ecosystem diversity in it. One major reason we have so much ecological diversity in the state is that we have mountains. Uh, the mountains provide lots of nooks and crannies and different elevations and different um, moisture gradients and temperature gradients, et cetera, et cetera, that lead to uh, different um, settings that support different species. So the more um, variation you have in a landscape, the, um, the more natural variation you have in a landscape, the more species you're going to support. And we certainly see a lot of that because of the mountains in the state. <clears throat> okay, um, if you ever meet uh, biologists, field biologists that know anything about Alabama um, in your travels outside of the state, and what they will probably know about Alabama is that we've got a tremendous diversity of, of rivers and streams in the state, and that um, they're chock full of um, endemic species and rare and threatened species. And that's really the ecosystem type that um, is what promotes Alabama's high uh, species diversity rankings. Okay, so um, the first answer to the question, why does the state have so many species was, well, we've got a lot of ecosystems. That naturally leads to another question, uh, why do we have so many ecosystems in Alabama? And let's get to that. First of all, let's talk about climate. Um, the state gets lots of heat and sunlight because we're in the Sun Belt. Um, that means that we have long growing seasons where plants can do a lot of growth. That's a, that's a lot of primary productivity that sustains a lot of secondary productivity. So basically that's a fancy way of saying Plants grow a lot and animals eat a lot of plants and therefore animals grow a lot, right? Um, so we get lots of heat and sunlight, um, but the reason plants are so abundant in the state and, they, and there's so much primary productivity is because we got lots of rain. Uh, this is a, a map showing uh, annual rainfall in the lower 48 U.S. states and you see that Alabama is at the center of a region of high rainfall. Um, so that combined with lots of sunlight and heat from that sunlight, they're not the same. Um, the heat helps keep 
things in operating temperature, good operating temperatures for, for biochemistry, and the sunlight is what's used for photosynthesis. So I separate those two out, as you should as well. So a combination of sunlight, heat, and rain is why Alabama is such a luscious state in terms of <clears throat> excuse me, in terms of having so many um, different ecosystems. Okay. Now another factor for why we climate is relevant here is that we have lots of fires created by lots of lightning. So rolling back a few slides, uh, the longleaf pine ecosystems, they're only able to survive because fires come through and burn off trees that would otherwise invade. Same is true of prairies. Uh, fires, um, as well as soil conditions, uh, keep out other trees. You see all those cedars in the background? Well, if you don't have uh, fires come through here um, er periodically, uh, those cedars will take over this ecosystem and squeeze out all these plants like these golden rods that you see here. Okay, so another reason, so our, our third reason um, that has to do with climate is that we've got lots of lightning. Okay, moving on here. Um, if you look at uh, climate belts that are around the planet, so I'm going to flip forward to a slide here um, that shows that map in more detail. Uh, this is this is a map of the world's biomes, and you see that there. Let's first look at the patterns here, and then we'll look at like why the patterns fall apart. So the world's biomes, and if you're not familiar with the biome, go ahead and look that up again as a review from BI 225. The world's biomes do have patterns across the planet, and they generally are patterns associated with latitude, distance from the equator. So for example, you see that the light blue up here is tundra. That's um, uh, habitats. Um, dominated by uh, small plants, uh, small flowering plants, uh, without any trees. Um, it's covered by snow and ice for much of the year, and then it gets a short growing season. That's the tundra environment. And you see a band of it across the top of the planet. Below that, you have a type of ecosystem called taiga, T-A-I-G-A, -A, taiga. And the taiga ecosystem is um, also in a band across the top of the planet. And then further south, you see a band of deserts. Here we got the, the western U.S., we got the Sahara, we got the Middle East and parts of South Asia. And that's all at about 30 to 35 degrees north of the equator. And then at the same latitude south of the equator, not exactly in South America, but we basically have drier ecosystems and deserts in South America. Same for the same latitudes um, corresponding to the north for our deserts in South Africa and Australia. So we do have these general patterns, and of course I skipped over the tropical rainforests that are along the equator, that are the, that's the dark green. But you also see a lot of variation here, for example, and um, you can probably figure out some of that variation. Notice the, the blue here, the montane zone. We got montane habitat stretching from Alaska all the way down um, and including the Rockies in the western U.S., and that creates different ecosystems that are there um, in an otherwise desert environment. And you see other you know, mountain ranges around the world creating these, this variation. All that to point out that the Earth is very complex. Um, it's more than just temperature bands across the planet that, de that determine where biomes are found. So what are we getting? What are we leading to here? What does this have to do with Alabama? Well, check out where Alabama is on this map. At the same latitude across the planet, you mostly have deserts, but Alabama is clearly not a desert. The same is also true for Southeast Asia. What is it that Alabama and Southeast Asia have in common? Maybe pause this video here for just a second and see if you can figure it out. Okay, let's see if you figured it out. They both have a warm ocean or, or sea to their south, okay? So we got the Gulf of Mexico here south of uh, Alabama, and then we've got um, parts of the Indian Ocean, and I, th I think this is the South China Sea here surrounding um, uh, Southeast Asia. And these oceans are responsible for why Alabama, um, or, or the Gulf of Mexico is why Alabama doesn't look like a desert. What basically happens is that um, having that warm uh, tropical water just off our doorstep, a lot of that water evaporates and as water vapor is blown inland. And, um, and you, so you wind up having the trade winds bringing that, that moisture inland as well as the heat from the Gulf of Mexico that, that makes our winters very mild and makes us very wet all year long on a typical year. 
And so um, that is why Alabama is not a desert. It's because of the Gulf of Mexico um, bringing us all that, um, that moisture. Okay, so that explains the, the, the riddle of why Alabama isn't a desert. Now, how important is climate for Alabama's biodiversity? We spent a few minutes talking about that. It's certainly important, otherwise I wouldn't bring it up. But it's not the most important um, explanation for why Alabama has so many species. And that should be pretty clear um, once you understand this map that I got in front of you now. Um, this is the southern, southeastern states and south central states, and you see the numbers here representing the, um, their rankings in terms of total species biodiversity. Like we talked about before, Alabama's ranked number five. Well, Alabama and Mississippi essentially share the same climate, but Mississippi's ranked number 17, and that's not just because they're Mississippi. Or Mississippi. It has to do with something else. In fact, look at Louisiana. It's ranked number 18. South Carolina, in the same, basically also warm and wet, is ranked number 14. Whereas neighboring Georgia is number six, and Georgia and Alabama and Florida, you know, five, six, and seven. Texas, number two. So if climate was the main driver for why some states have more species than others here in the South, um, then we would see similarity across these states, but clearly something else is going on. As you probably already know, but uh, don't feel bad if you don't, that's okay. Um, the reason why we've got so many species in Alabama and Georgia has to do with our geologic diversity. Uh, Alabama is a very diverse state in terms of its geology. Um, this is a, a map, a geologic map of the state. Each color represents either a different type of rock formation that's at the surface, or in the case of the coastal plain down here, it's a different uh, marine sediment that was exposed as sea levels uh, fell um, over the last few hundred million years. Well, no, less than, less than um, 100 million years because uh, high sea levels persisted until about, we'll say, 55 million years ago or so. And then as the, as the Earth went into a cooling phase, um, more ice got locked up on land and sea levels dropped. But so wrap your head around that for a second. Here we, if you can follow the cursor, this is Birmingham right here. About 55 million years ago, you would not have to travel far to get to the beach. The only problem is, is that there would be, um, it would not necessarily be a beach that you would survive on very long because there would be all sorts of, uh, it would be after dinosaurs, but there would be lots of uh, uh, big scary mammals in their place that could um, potentially eat us for lunch. Um, and I bet we'd be tasty too. All right, so, um, okay, I get, let my uh, imagination get a hold of me there. Let's get back on target here. What I'm trying to illustrate here is that Alabama has a lot of geologic diversity, and you see that in this map. Now let's compare this with Mississippi. Remember Mississippi, how many, what's, what's Mississippi state rankings in terms of species biodiversity? That's right, it's 17. So if we look here um, at this, the same map, but focusing on Mississippi, um, what do you see? What's the difference? You see that Mississippi does not have as much geologic diversity as does Alabama. And this is, this is our big clue that it's geologic diversity that explains why Alabama has so many species. And so let's dive into that a little bit. What is it about geology that influences patterns of biodiversity? Um, well, uh, it has to do with surface bedrock. Uh, here I've got a picture from Oak Mountain State Park. This is just south of Birmingham. So you have habitats that look like that, just south of Birmingham at Oak Mountain. Uh, I mean, when I, if you were to show me that picture before I had moved to Birmingham, I would have said, oh yeah, that's probably Arizona or New Mexico. Uh, that looks like Ponderosa Pine habitat there. Nope, that's right here in Alabama. So having different types of rocks at the surface create lots of different types of environments. Um, one of the ways that it does that is influencing soil chemistry. Um, and we'll talk about that in just a minute. But having different types of rocks at the surface influences lots of different things. Okay, soils. Um, so this little panel up at the top right features four different ecosystems, very different ecosystems across the state from, from our dunes at the beach to um, the red hills of, um, of the coastal plain to uh, sandstone glades up here in the mountains to um, uh, alluvial floodplains, so river floodplains around our big rivers. 
the soils in these environments are dramatically different from one another and they are the soils are why the vegetation is so different and the vegetation is why the animals that you find there are so different okay so soil diversity supports different ecosystems across the state and all of that goes back originally to the the, the bedrock or the sediments that were laid down a long time ago um, to close the loop a little bit about soil diversity um, Different types of rocks create different types of soils. So the sandstone that you see here at the bottom left, um, as that weathers, it creates a soil that's very acidic. Well, not very acidic. It's just it's slightly acidic. However, on other mountains nearby, you've got limestone exposed. And when limestone weathers, it creates a soil that's very alkaline, um, so or basic in its chemistry. And uh, slightly acidic soil supports one group of plant species and the alkaline soils support a different group of plant species. And so that nicely illustrates why surface bedrock and soils in combination with one another can create a lot of biodiversity within a small region. Um, because all you have to do is get to a different type of rock outcrop or soil type and you're going to have different plant species and therefore animal species. All right, a third and final reason that geology influences species biodiversity patterns has to do with topographic diversity. So topography is a, like the study of the different landforms. And here we see like a little section of earth as if it was cut out from the Cumberland Plateau, which is up in northeastern Alabama. The Cumberland extends farther up the Appalachians, but this is, was depicted for northeastern Alabama. And each of the numbers represents a different position in the landscape where conditions are different. Um, for example, five and six, one is a what five is a west facing um, uh, slope and six is a is an east facing slope. Um, two is up on the high on the plateau, whereas nine is down next to the river. OK, I think you get the idea. The, the main take home message here is that for each of these nine different types of positions in the landscape, you're going to get a different combination of sunlight and soil um, and water availability and exposure to different types of disturbances like floods or tornadoes and things like that. So in each of those nine positions, you're going to have a different composition of plant species and therefore animal species. And indeed, um, you can see that over just a short walk if we were up there at Little River Canyon, for example, within just a 20 minute hike, we could go from the plateau up here all the way down to, um, the, to, to a little river and see a tremendous diversity of ecosystems along the way. That would not be there if it wasn't for the topographic diversity. We would just have one type of ecosystem over a large area instead. That's kind of Mississippi's problem. It just doesn't have that topographic diversity. Okay, So these three things, bedrock and soils and topography, they're all tied together. Um, in terms of their origins with geology. Um, but splitting out, you can begin to see and better like how that leads to different ecosystems and different species supported in those ecosystems. All right, um, to kind of drive this uh, a little bit further in terms of comparing states, what I've got here is a map of the lower 48 and a very simplified geologic map. Each color represents a different uh, grouping of rock formations in the lower 48. And what we're going to do is here, we're going to look at state rankings for um, the states that are in the Sun Belt across the southern tier of the US. And that way we'll keep constant, the, or like kind of experimentally, we'll keep constant the amount of sunlight and um, that, these, that these states get. And when we look to the west, uh, we find that our top four states in the US are all western states with a tremendous amount of geologic diversity. Uh, California and Texas lead the way. They've got lots of geologic diversity. They've also got coastlines and mountains and deserts. They've got elevational variation, et cetera, et cetera. And they're just large, just unfairly large. I mean, Alabama's like, what, a fifth the size of Texas? I mean, that's just not fair. Um, Alabama's what, about a third the size of California, maybe two-fifths or so? Yeah, so it's hard to compete with those two states for sure. Um, all, but really what I want you to focus in on is not my jealousy about those other states, but the fact that they have a tremendous amount of geologic diversity. Now let's look into the east. Um, these three states are all in the Sun Belt. Um, 
South Carolina, Mississippi, and Louisiana, and they all have relatively low levels of geologic diversity. South Carolina, for example, uh, gets into the Piedmont, the foothills of the Appalachians, but it doesn't have any of the Appalachians themselves. Mississippi and Louisiana are, are all coastal plain, and they have um, a lot of diversity there, but it's not anything like you find in the neighboring states. Now let's look at uh, the, uh, Georgia and Alabama. Uh, Alabama is ranked number five, and not surprisingly, now that you know that geology is important, Georgia, which has very similar geology, is ranked number six for uh, species biodiversity. So again, what this is illustrating is that the more geologic diversity you have, the more species you have. Okay. Now, what state have I left out of this? That's right, I've left out Florida. Uh, Florida, if you take a look at Florida, based on what I've told you so far, what do you think Florida's ranking is going to be in terms of its biodiversity? Pause if you need more time to think. Okay, if you thought that Florida should have biodiversity similar to Mississippi or Louisiana or South Carolina, then you have correctly kept up with me in terms of the logic that I've been presenting so far. However, uh-oh, Florida ranks number seven. What's going on? All right, here's what's really going on. Geology is just one form of natural variation in the landscape. You can also have variation in climate as well. And Florida, because it swings all the way down here into the subtropics, it has a lot of Caribbean species that are found down here that you don't find farther north. So while Florida lacks geologic diversity, it makes up for that in terms of its climate diversity. Okay, so climate diversity can be very important. Um, it's just not important at the scale uh, for Alabama quite as much as it, as it is for, um, for Florida. Um, a state like Tennessee that is very narrow from top to bottom in terms of latitude um, has, um, is really limited by climate, whereas Alabama has more influence of, of climate, um, but not as much as you see in Florida. Okay, so and all this to say that um, geology is the number one reason why Alabama has so many species, uh, but climate is also important. Um, and this is true the world over. Um, and in some places, climate might be more important than geology for trying to explain like why one country or the other has more species. It, it depends. You'd have to take it case by case scenario. The real message is the more natural variation you have in your landscape, by climate or geology or maybe some other factor, the more natural variation you have, the more ecosystems you're going to have, and the more species you're going to have. Okay. Our third reason for why Alabama has so many species has to do with our rich evolutionary past. This is a story that goes back hundreds of millions of years. Let me just pull out a couple of highlights. Let's go back now to about 18,000 years ago. That's what this picture represents during the peak of the last ice age. Remember the ice ages lasted from about two and a half million years ago to about 10,000 years ago or so. And during that time, it was mostly cold. And most of that time, uh, northern North America was covered up with this ginormous ice sheet. But every once in a while, things would thaw out and get kind of warm like they are today, or at least that they up until recently with climate change. And then things would freeze over for a long time and then it warm up for a short time and go back and forth like that all the time. Okay, so um, what I want to illustrate here is that when you are covered up with an ice sheet that can be up to two miles thick, that doesn't leave a lot of um, room for ecosystems to survive. Um, so the southeast and parts of the Midwest and so forth were um, these in these states. Um, species were able to survive and not to go extinct underneath an ice sheet. So that's a little, that's one little story about our evolutionary past. And by evolutionary past, I'm kind of using that term more liberally, more broadly to talk about like the things influencing populations or species through time, not necessarily talking about what generates the evolution of new species, although I'm going to get to that very shortly here. Um, this is just a, a vegetation map from the last ice age. I think we'll skip past that. You don't there, that just reinforces the points I'd already made. This is just to remind me to talk about how during the ice ages, during the Pleistocene, um, the North America had a lot of large 
mammal species. Um, we call them megafauna because of their size. This is a ground sloth, but we also had several species of mastodon and mammoths, both of which are elephantine species, like our elephants that are found in uh, Africa and Asia. Um, we had many other large species. We had glyptodonts, which looked like armadillos on steroids the size of a smart car. Um, we had several species of bison. We had short-faced bears. We had dire wolves. We had North American lions, et cetera, et cetera. The place was a, a wonderland when it comes to mammal biodiversity. All that disappeared after the last ice age. And the smoking gun for that um, isn't the end of the ice age. It's because humans showed up during that time. And the transition from an ice age to the warm periods that would happen between the ice ages, that was always difficult for populations, no doubt. But when you add to it that now you've got these, um, these primates running around with spears and other weapons that are hunting in groups and they're very intelligent and they can plot and scheme and strategize and so forth, it led to the decimation of a lot of the megafauna and led to their extinction. So it was a combination of these events, um, but really mostly um, the, the influence of humans on the landscape that, um, has, that led to the loss of the megafauna. Again, an another piece of our evolutionary history here in the Southeast, in this case, um, macroevolution um, involving extinction. All right, so now what I wanna do is turn to sort of longer term, the longer arc of evolutionary history to explain why Alabama has so many aquatic species. And to begin with that, I wanna look at this map, which is, goes back to the Permian at about 290 million years ago and the formation of the Appalachian Mountains. What was happening here is that uh, the continents, the continental plates of the world, they move around. Um, and at this time, they had collided with North America. South America and Africa and North America had collided, and the crumple zone there where they mashed up formed the Appalachian Mountains. Now, the Appalachian Mountains are a very ancient uh, range, but at the and they've had a lot of time to erode down. That's why they're not um, as tall as other mountain ranges in the world are today. Um, to get an idea of how tall the Appalachians were at this time, you'd have to go visit a place like the Alps or the Andes or the Himalayas um, or Himalayas, if you will. Um, you have to see those young, fresh mountains to kind of get an idea of how big the Appalachians were. Okay. All right. So what happened here is that the Appalachian Mountains created um, a landscape that has all that bedrock and soil and topographic diversity that we talked about earlier. And it's because of that influence by having the mountains here in Alabama that we have so many species because of the topographic diversity, the surface bedrock diversity, the climate and the climate variation. We do get some climate variation from low elevations to high elevations, some differences in temperature and rainfall and so forth in the state. It's subtle. It's not as it's not like you'd find in, in a taller mountain range, but it's there and it does have some influence on our biodiversity. But the big reason, the major reason why Alabama has so many species that's tied to the mountains has to do with the fact that the mountains fractured the landscape into multiple large watersheds. Here's a picture of those watersheds. What we're looking at is the state of Alabama and the major watersheds of the state. And I want you to think back to Evo Eco and remember how the situations for allopatric situation Sorry, I'm getting a little tired here from talking so fast. The situation that leads to allopatric speciation is when populations become isolated. We talked a lot about islands as a way that that happens. That also happens on mountain ranges, and it also happens in the headwaters of rivers. So check out the Black Warrior River Basin, the one that's yellow here that looks like the, a, a footprint, a left foot, barefoot footprint. And the uh, Black Warrior River, it splits into three major forks up the top, the Sipsi, the Mulberry, and the Locust Fork. Up here in these headwater regions, the streams are, are smaller, they're shallower, they're rockier, the water's clear, um, and it's surrounded by forest and, and so forth. So like the, the trees are overlapping over the stream. Very, very, very different ecological conditions for aquatic animals then you would find lower in the watershed downstream where you'd have a big river. It's very wide, it's very deep, very muddy, very cold, um, very different conditions. And also with a lot of big predators that could eat little fishes and things like that, okay? 
So these headwater regions up here, they become isolating um, places of isolation where snails and mussels and fishes and crayfishes get isolated for long periods of time and eventually evolve into new species. And in fact, across these three forks up here, you can find some species that are endemic to just the Sipsi or just the mulberry or just the locust fork. So all that to illustrate just for this one watershed, how you can get um, a lot of new aquatic species arising over evolutionary time. And that's just the Black Warrior watershed. Um, in the neighboring Cahaba watershed, the same things were happening. Um, and even more different than the black, than the say the Sipsi and Mulberry and Locust Fork, because you've got a, com a not a completely different group of species over here that are evolving, but a, a more different group than you'd have up here. And the same is true for the Coosa, which is over here, and the Tallapoosa, and so forth and so on. The Tennessee River, the largest river uh, in in the east. Um, it has all these side watersheds like the Elk River and the Paint Rock River and others that, again, where, where new species evolved and, um, and are endemic to those river systems. So the reason that we have so many of these large watersheds that can crank out lots of plant, lots of um, aquatic animal species over large periods of time has to do with the fact that the mountains have fractured the landscape. The mountains in this case, um, come right down here from the northeastern corner of the state right through to the very end of the Cahaba watershed down here. So all of this up here, including the Tennessee River Basin and all the way over here to the Tallapoosa and the northern part of the Chattahoochee, which is over in Georgia, all of that is influenced by the mountains um, having created different places for species to evolve. So that helps tie it off for why geology is the major explanation for why we've got so many aquatic species in the state. Okay, and I got all that written out there for you. And I'll post these, these slides on, um, on Moodle for you. Okay, that's a wrap. That's why Alabama has so many species. So be sure to study that. I will definitely give you um, exam questions about that in, um, on a day not too far from now. See ya.